I just want to tell you that I love the Beatles. And being a child at the age of 14, I was an avid collector of Beatles stuff. I had pretty much everything that you could probably think of. Mugs, pins, t-shirts, posters, music, everything. <laughs> I was even there at their first concert. They really do have great music and some really damn great talent. I have their albums, t-shirts, and other assorted items as I've said before. I even enjoyed their old cartoon of the Beatles that was made in the 60s, even if it wasn't amazing. But it wasn't long before I found out that there was a morbid secret to the cartoon. I was at a local collector shop when they had a selection about the Beatles. I was looking for some Beatle mugs and pins. I had wind up finding a couple and I bought two Beatles mugs and four Beatles pins and just as I was about to leave the section, something wind up catching my eye. It was a videotape entitled The Beatles Cartoon, The Lost Episode, or at least that's what I assumed it was. Being what was scribbled on it with what appeared to be in black sharpie, I honestly wanted to get it, so I told my disjointed mother that I wanted to buy it. When we went to purchase the tape, the counter worker said that I couldn't have it. He told me that he watched it and that he had had some nightmares about it. I was rather surprised by this. I mean, why exactly would he say that? It was just a tape from the Beatles. How exactly can a cartoon about that band possibly be that scary? But after a little bit of prying, he said, fine, <laughs> you're just gonna get nightmares anyway. And he just gave me the tape. And while I was walking away, I thought I saw him folding his hands like he was praying. For some odd reason, I started to feel like maybe there was something wrong with the tape or maybe something wrong with him, I really had no idea. And when I got home, I immediately went downstairs to watch this mysterious video. When I saw the tape starting to play, something weird happened in the beginning. It was what sounded, it was the sounds of someone screaming in complete agony, which while that was normal for the Beatles cartoon, there was a, usually a title card accompanying it. I was rather freaked out until the title card thankfully faded in a few seconds later. The episode was called Because, and I assumed it was referring to the Abbey Road song Because. Then the cartoon played, and something was really off. It was slightly different from the original style. It looked almost similar to the original, but it looked slightly darker and a little more detailed. Then the episode showed all four Beatles and their trademark grotesque original designs, John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Despite the past oddity, I relaxed hearing the trademark Paul Freeze and Lance Percival voicing the Fab Four. They were also talking about how they had found some CD outside of the recording studio and were thinking about listening to it. Now, this right off the beat was a little bit strange as CDs weren't invented until 1976 and the show was produced in the late 60s. So then the scene suddenly transitioned to the Beatles in their recording studio. The shot showed John casually putting the headphones on until something happened. John all of a sudden looked like he had just completely blacked out. Then Paul worriedly asked, John, are you alright? Then the scene zoomed in on John who had started drooling, and then all of a sudden John's eyes turned to what I could only describe it with my limited vocabulary, an LSD, LSD acid trip image with weird colors. After 10 seconds of John's acid dripping face, something appeared. I grabbed the clicker and went back to see what it was. What I saw was a morbid grotesque picture. It was a real photo of a man with a ventriloquist dummy. The scary part about the picture was that the man with the dummy had no mouth. Instead, there was blood on his face where his mouth was supposed to be. The dummy had fire in his eyes and an insane smile. I had to choke back some vomit after watching it. Then the screen went back to equally as vomit-inducing sight, which was John's face. Are, are you alright? asked Ringo. Seeing is not believing. Seeing is killing. John said in a dull monotone as though he was in some sort of trance. John soon snapped back react John soon snapped back into reality, shaking his head and it replied, yeah, yes, yes. Uh, what time is it, George? It's 1.13, George answered nonchalantly. Then the screen went black and blood started to rain down, but this blood looked more realistic than anything else I had ever seen in the other episode. It looked so real that if I touched the screen, I would somehow get blood on my fingers. The blood rain soon disappeared and another scene soon faded in, showing the Beatles walk into a lake. A crowd of girls started chasing the guys for almost a minute when all of a sudden, a picture of the girl with no eyes appeared on the screen. 
It was an actual black and white picture of a person with just her eye sockets dripping with blood. She had no teeth and there was more blood pouring out of the mouth. I jumped back on my couch after seeing it. The screen then went to John's face and all of a sudden the screaming of the fans stopped. And when all four of them turned around to check, all the fans were on the ground burning to a crisp. Paul, clearly petrified, asked, "What? What happened? The screen then showed Ringo vomiting out red vomit with chunks of brown meat. Something caught my eye though. I paused and looked closely at the vomit and there was a face of Hitler. I was somewhat shocked that a man who killed a lot of people and soldiers was in a cartoon about the Beatles. Just forget about it, John sharply shouted back. But what, what, what about our fans? I don't give a fuck. You know what happened to my first wife. I was shocked that the episode involved John saying the F word, but I decided to continue on. The next scene showed a building that was about to be demolished. The Beatles were walking down the street when the wrecking ball hit the building. A piece of rubble went flying in the air and it was about to miss a person when John did something despicable. In typical John fashion, he proceeded to push the man back to where the piece of rubble was about to fall. In a second, a piece of solid marble crushed the guy to death. Blood and brain matter flew everywhere. Even though the blurring matter and blood still looked cartoonish, it was still pretty horrible. A crowd of people quickly surrounded the scene, and the scene zoomed up to John with an evil smirk on his face. The next scene only showed just a black screen. The only thing that could be heard was a gunshot. There was what a smoke and there was smoke in what I appeared representing the fired gun. Then the screen faded into a shot of the recording studio. The studio had no lights on, causing the scene to be too dark to make anything out. But there was quiet mumbling, and I listened closely to hear someone dully whispering, I, I, sh I shouldn't have done that. They're going to know soon. Then one light went on. There was a shadow outside of the door, and it was a form of John. It wasn't long until the light was reflecting the sound manager in the recording booth. Dead. I quickly put two and two together and figured out that this man was shot by John, who had a gun for whatever reason. The camera zoomed up to the ground outside of the room. A model M1887 fell to the ground with blood splattered on it and with bits of smoke still coming out of the barrel. The scene suddenly cut to show John Paul to show Paul, George, and Ringo knocking on John's room door. Then Ringo proceeded to bust the door down with his trademark strong, sexy insect legs. And there was a humongous safe that was in the size of the SOV, as an SUV. They didn't know what the combination was, but for whatever reason, it wasn't locked up all the way. They opened it up, and they found out John's secret. He was a Satanist. There was a dead body of a woman on a pentagram drawn in her blood with her eyes gouged out. There were dead animals, a fan-made Necronomicon, and a goat skull on a pentagram. In fear, George fell to the ground. Paul had to choke back vomit. Ringo ran over to the corpse and yelled out, Jenny, no. He then slumped to the ground and closed his eyes. Then Ringo started crying in a sad way. The crying from Ringo didn't sound like normal cartoon crying. It sounded as real as day. And in shock, I found out that the dead woman was Ringo's fiance, Jenny. I didn't even know that Ringo had a fiance, but I decided to continue on. Suddenly, just some distorted screens of a girl started to play in the background. I started to suspect that this was supposedly screams from Jenny herself. The screen went black, and the screen showed the view of the sun setting from John's legs. The scene immediately went into John's face, who had a mad expression and a rapid moving mouth. He had red in his left iris. He looked like he, he looked like it was ripped by a rabid raccoon. He had his noose around his neck. He was about to end himself. He then shut his eyes and jumped. The camera showed John's feet still swinging. The camera zoomed out to show John's lifeless body hanging on a small cliff on the lake that the Beatles were going to in the beginning of the episode. The screen went black and Paul appeared in a, in a sad expression. The screen went black again and the scary part began. Without warning, Paul's face appeared with hyper-realistic eyes. There were so many camera views of Paul's face like a zoom out of him in the corner. The pictures reappeared. I remember seeing a picture of a hand with a gun on it and the gun was pointed to a kid's head, but the gun was already fired. Another picture flashed on the screen of a garfish in the river. The next pish picture was of a burnt town. People were on the ground dead. Quickly, I discovered that the town had been destroyed during an attack. The next picture was three undertakers with seven coffins with little children no younger than six. And up behind the left undertaker was a coffin with a hand coming out of it, and the hand was moving. After more pictures, it showed Paul with the same expression. 
that he had before the scary slideshow, when suddenly he heard a loud booming voice of a low, quiet voice saying, Do it. Then an M1911 Colt pistol appeared in Paul's hand. He put the gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Realistic blood, brain matter went everywhere, like on the grass and in the cliff. Then the camera zoomed up to the time caps, uh, capsule of the bullet that shot Paul, and the capsule read, Your life was already over, Paul, in a mysterious Russian accent. The next scene showed George on the cliff with the same lake John had ended himself. He was about to do exactly the same thing. I thought he was going to jump off at the glyph, but instead he pulled out a gun and shot himself. It was very anticlimactic, but still. At the end of the scene, the camera zoomed in on the gun, and the gun was the same one that Paul used to end himself. On the side, it said, It takes two bullets to kill two beetles. It scared me a little bit. It even sent chills down my spine. The next scene showed Ringo in the hospital, dying of an unknown disease. It, he took a picture of him and his fiance in the engagement ring he gave her, and then he had passed away. Then the scene faded, with the ending music playing. After about a minute, another shot faded in. It appeared to be a dark hall. All I heard were screams, whistles, yelling, and gunshots. I soon found out that the hall was in a prison. The scary part was that every time the lamps swinged from the hall, a black hooded figure appeared. It wasn't long until I found out that it was John with gray skin and red irises. For a brief second, I thought he resembled the trademark webcomic character, Karat Vintas. He shouted, I hope you enjoyed your life because my life is over, including my friends, all because of me, John. Right behind him was a crowd of guards and prisoners. It seemed that some of them had bullet holes in their heads and blood all over their bodies. In the crowd, I could make out several people in grotesque Beatles cartoons design. Many, many, many different people that I couldn't even recognize. The really weird part was that the prisoner that stood right next to John was Mark David Chapman, the man who killed John Lennon. It scared me how the guy who was there was right beside the evil, cartoony individual. For 30 seconds, Lucy... For 30 seconds, evil John and the crowd of prisoners and guards started walking straight as if they were walking towards me. They kept walking, and the more blood seemed to get on themselves. They did nothing more than just that. Then the episode finally ended. I went backwards and kept rewinding the opening credits to believe how stupid I was to believe that this honestly could have been anything else more than that. It wasn't long until something caught my eye. I looked closely at the bottom of the word because, and I paused to see the episode was actually called The Beatles Cartoon, Because of John, They're Dead. I was about to take the tape out of the VCR when it suddenly caught on fire. I immediately got my, my I got, immediately pulled out my mom and a fire extinguisher. We put out the fire to discover that somehow the VCR was still okay because we put in more tapes in and they still managed to work. But the only thing that had been destroyed by the fire was the tape. And what, apparently it turns out that the tape was what actually had caused the fire. My mother and I went back to the collector's shop and I brought the tape back. The counter worker for the store asked, what happened to the tape? I told him that I had set it on, it wound up setting on fire. He roughly grabbed the tape and immediately violently chucked it in the trash bin saying, it should have burnt to a crisp. I don't really know what else more to say about it, but all I can say is, I don't know why that tape said hello. I say, Goodbye. Penis. Well, my little shadows, what better way to sit there and make a wonderful comeback after three weeks of not uploading a single video, apologies by the way for that, than to sit there and narrate a creepypasta. And this creepypasta being a lost episode creepypasta about the Beatles. Now, I want to go out of my way and start this off by saying that, obviously I kind of expected that, um... I fully expected this pasta to be bad. I remember listening to a narration of this by Dave the Useless sometime a while back. Years back, actually, <laughs> shockingly enough. And obviously, it's about as cliched as all hell as it can be. Now, I will say, though, that despite this story being cliched as all hell, I gotta say, it kind of had a, it has a little bit of a small place in my blackened heart because, personally for me, despite, again, the mess that this story was, it was still pretty enjoyable for what it was worth. Which is very rare for me to say because normally I tear stories like these apart, but in this situation and the like, I'm not really going to go all over the place because I think that this, that's how it was meant to be. And in my honest viewpoint, I think that's pretty much fine. 
Now, with that stated, I do have a couple of things I do want to make a mention. First and foremost, the thing that I'm actually reading um, right now was actually heavily edited, and this was pretty evident as I was doing the narration during it, so I kind of had to sit there and just cut out a good chunk of parts that were just completely and utterly not included. I mean, there was literally a part where apparently there was a character named Lucy, who I guess is an anime character, saying, New? Yeah, obviously I wasn't going to throw that in. I mean, the story in of its own self is shit, at least in terms of cliche storytelling and like, but adding that in, it kind of makes you wonder who in the world decided to go out of their way and vandalize this page. I'm not really, I, like, I'm, I want to make something clear. As much as I don't like very poorly made Lost episode pastas, going out of one's way and sitting there and, um completely and utterly wrecking the story and just adding a bunch of stupid crap and everything, editing it, you know, and all that, just for the sake of doing so, it's kind of a shitty thing to do in my opinion. I mean, again, if you're going out of your way and you're sitting there and you're doing it to primarily add more, edit things, or, you know, try and make the story at least a little bit more readable, that's understandable, but just sit there and just completely vandalize a story like this by throwing in a bunch of crap, I mean, the story is a crappy pasta and of its own self, but... Still, just gonna say right now, never ever do that kind of thing, people. Now, as for the pasta itself, it's pretty typical that it ripped off a good chunk of pastas. I mean, it has a bunch of rip-offs from Squidward's suicide, which is kind of obvious in a good way. I mean, with the scenes with, you know, dead people, um, hyper-realistic eyes, um, the word do it being consistently stated over, well, at least one time. I mean, it's quite, I mean, you can definitely tell that to some extent or another, there is a little bit, oh, I'm not even going to say inspiration, it's not inspired, it's just rip, it's just a rip-off, primarily. Not to mention that we have, like, you know, the blood, the gore, the brain matter, everything else like such. It's a pretty poorly executed story, and the grammar in this, I might add, is just vile and god-awful. I mean, especially with the way that the sentence structuring is, I mean, there's so many different, um, um, you know, punctuational errors and everything. I mean, you, there's not even a comma to sit... Well, I mean, there's a couple of commas and everything, but the whole... E everything else, for that matter, it just... It's difficult to really read at times without sitting there and, you know, uh, just kind of wondering what the fuck is even going on right now. Now, another thing, too, I also noticed is that there was another part that apparently was taken out, I guess, or wasn't included in the original, about how, you know, the individual wind up going out and finding, at least from the narration I wind up listening to, apparently about people, you know, the protagonist going and seeing that the police had wind up finding an entire home, you know, with a bunch of sketches and everything, basically showing that the episode in question was made by a bunch of random individuals, which... In all honesty, despite the cliché nature of the story, I actually thought was kind of clever to include. Because, you know, instead of sitting there and saying, Oh, this was an official episode, it was just somebody that made it just for the sake of fucking with someone. But apparently they also did a bunch of illegal shit, like, you know, um, grave robbing, I guess. Which kind of doesn't make sense, but I guess that, that probably would explain the pictures in, in question, I guess. It's so really unfortunate that that wasn't included in the story, because, again... Despite the cliche nature of it, at least, it, the very least, that ending part actually does go out of its way and explain the nature of it, which, in my personal opinion, while I, I can't entirely excuse the cliches, at the very least, it's an explanation as to why the whole thing was just a giant fucked up mess. You know, that's exactly what people made. And especially nowadays with the technology and this animation software, and they're like, you could easily do something like this. So yeah, with that said, that's really all I have to say with this story. There's really not much else to say other than it's just a cliched mess. And again, you know, condemning, you know, vandalism of the story, yada, 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 yada. My final rating of the story, I'm going to give this one solely because of the fact that this was one that I, I like, ironically, I guess you could say. Um, I'd probably give this one like maybe a 4 out of 10 at most. It's an enjoyable little read, especially if you listen to the narration of by Dave the Useless. But outside of that, it's still a relatively crappy story for the most part. That's really all I have to say here. Now, before I do end this video, I actually want to sit there and give a little bit of a special shout-out to someone. 
Now, this someone actually happens to be so someone who wound up going out of their way and uh, did an entire amazing video uh, doing a narration of one of my um, crabby pastas, Freddy's Depressed.avi, which um, let me go on my community tab real quickly because I kind of <laughs> forgot. Oh, yeah. Uh, the guy's name is Derpentine. Now, I will leave a link down below in his, um, for his channel and a couple of video links if you want to go and check him out. But seriously, go check this guy out. He puts a lot of time and effort into the videos that he sits there and he makes. I mean, they're entertaining. They're enjoyable. I'm practically addicted to them. So this is a bit of a shout out to him. So make sure of it to go and check him out in the description below. I'll also make sure to leave a link down in the in a pinned comment below so that way you guys can go and check him out. And of course, like I say, go and watch his videos like him subscribe to him if you want to and just go out of your way and say that shadow sent sent you because honestly he's an amazing uh, he's an amazing pasta um narrator he's an amazing guy who just i think makes awesome content go out of your way give him some love give him some support he definitely deserves it and of course like i say with every video that i make this is simply my own personal opinion, and if you disagree with it, that's perfectly fine too. We're all entitled to our own opinions in regards to creepy pastas like these, and this is simply my own personal thoughts. I've already given my rating, so I'm not going to give it. So, I'll leave this. What did you guys think about this pasta? Did you guys enjoy it? Did you guys not? And what would you have personally done to make the story a whole lot better? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. I'm the Shadow Reader. Thanks again for watching today's episode, my little shadows. And again, sorry for the massive delay. Um, oh, and one more little announcement before I do forget. I am getting to uh, Joda Octavius's Barnstorm. I was going to make this a community post, but I decided to throw it in here. So again, another little shout out to Joda Octavius. Um, I am narrating his story, Barnstorm, but I'm doing a little bit more and I'm making it a full-on animatic in different parts of course i'm not going to do it all at once like i originally intended to but i'm going to do it you know obviously in parts with a full-on animatic i'm going to try and see if i can get it done within the next two weeks if possible so don't expect that video anytime soon because i really want to make sure of it that it's perfectly done and properly drawn out it will take me some time to get done but still i really want to go out of my way and give as much of an opportunity to really give this story as much justice as possible so yeah Thanks again for watching today's My Little Shadows. I'm the Shadow Reader, and like always, roll the outro because I'm out. In fear and surprise, as your eyes widen, your mouth goes dry with each battered breath. You try to scream, your mind begs to be glued to your computer screen. The killers they slash, the tapes burn and crash The cartridge you bought will be your final haunt The rituals of hate will seal your fate The tears you shed will be from the fear-gripping portrait that marriage your fill terrorizing hateful burning violent rage inducing knives slashing blood splattering silent screams only time will tell if you will escape this online hell your horror filled obsessions will come with its own regressions your pathetic screams will not be heeded in any way because your nightmares will come at any day